Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in our earlier lecture, we had the discussion on the topic of a rule making power of the administration that is the delegated legislation. Under the topic rule making powers of administration, the delegated legislation, we discussed the meaning of delegated legislation, the concept of delegated legislation its need, the factors responsible for the growth and development of delegated legislation. Today, I have come with the topic, the constitutionality of delegated legislation. After understanding the concept of delegated legislation, the meaning of delegated legislation and various kinds of delegated legislation, it is essential for us to know the constitutional limits of delegated legislation. We know the fact that when the administrative rule making powers and administrative adjudicatory powers were recognized, essentially these powers were not assigned to the administration or the executive branch of the government, but because of the need of the time, because of the development of the concept of a state, because of the increased functions of the government and the state the state had to assume the adjudicatory powers and the rule making powers, the powers relating to delegated legislation. And therefore, it was inevitable to arise the question to raise the question of constitutionality of delegated legislation. Constitutionality of delegated legislation, it is very important topic because under this topic we will discuss that what are the permissible limits of delegated legislation or what are the constitutional limits to which the parliament or the legislature is permitted to delegate its legislative powers to the executive and what are the constitutional limits under which the delegate can exercise these delegated powers and therefore, I have come today with the topic, the constitutionality of delegated legislation. Friends, if we talk about the constitutionality of delegated legislation, then it is important for us to know the meaning of constitutionality. The constitutionality means the quality of being in accordance with the standards and parameters set by the constitution. The constitutionality means the quality of being in accordance with the standards and parameters set by the constitution. We know that in each and every democratic system, in each and every country, the constitution has specified the limits of powers of different three organs of the government. Under the topic of separation of powers, we have discussed it very well. We also know that the constitution assigns the functions to different three organs of the government and that organ is allowed to exercise only those powers. These organs are allowed to perform only those functions which have been specified by the constitution or the powers which have been conferred on that particular organ of the government. And if for any reason one organ exercises the powers which have not essentially conferred by the constitution on that organ, then certainly the question of the constitutionality arises. Then it becomes necessary for us to know that what are the standards, what are the parameters which have been prescribed by the constitution for each and every organ and to what limits those organs are allowed 
to perform their functions to exercise their powers. In this reference, the constitutionality means the quality of being in accordance with the standards and parameters set by the constitution. Constitutionality refers to the permissible limits of the constitution of any country. The constitutionality of delegated legislation refers to the permissible limits of delegated legislation, permissible limits to the parliament or legislature that to what extent it can delegate its legislative powers to the executive. Under the earlier topic, we have discussed, we have understood that because of the transformation from laissez faire to welfare state, because of the tremendously increased functions and powers of the government, it became necessary, it became inevitable to give the adjudicatory and legislative powers to the administration also. That was the point of time when the concept, the technique, the process of delegated legislation emerged out, the process of delegated legislation has grown, the process of delegated legislation was developed. Under the constitutionality of delegated legislation, we are to see that if for any compulsion, under any pressure for any reason, if the legislature or the parliament is to delegate its legislative powers which have been assigned by the constitution to it, then it is also important to set the limits of those powers to delegate. And therefore, the topic of constitutionality of delegated legislation becomes relevant in the study of administrative law. We know that the constitution assigns certain functions to all the legislature, executive and judicial branch of the government. Legislature has been assigned the legislative functions to perform and it is made the sole repository of law making powers. Under the technique of delegated legislation, the legislature is to delegate or the legislature is in need to delegate its law making powers to the executive. This delegation of law making powers to the executive certainly gives rise to a valid, relevant and significant question of constitutionality of delegated legislation. When we talk about the constitutionality of delegated legislation or permissible limits of delegated legislation, we refer to three important jurisdictions to see the situation. Particularly two jurisdictions, the UK and the USA and we are to compare the status of or permissible limits of delegated legislation in these countries with India. So, we will discuss the permissible limits of delegated legislation under this topic in three jurisdictions in UK, in US and in India. First of all, we take up the permissible limits of delegated legislation in UK. In United Kingdom, in England, in Britain, the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty prevails. We know that the fundamental constitutional principle which prevails in English legal system is a rule of law and another is the parliamentary sovereignty. Doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty makes the parliament the supreme to all the other organs of the state. So, the parliament becomes the superior most authority being sovereign and all other organs, all other institutions in UK are subordinate to the parliament. When the parliament is sovereign, it means that no outer limits can be put on the authority of parliament, no outer restrictions can be imposed over the authority of parliament, no restraints can be put on the power of parliament because the parliament is sovereign. And if 
no restraints can be imposed, no restrictions can be imposed, no external control can be put on the authority of parliament, then how to specify the limits to which the UK parliament, the British parliament could delegate its legislative powers to the executive. It was very difficult with reference to UK to specify the limits of parliament to delegate its powers to the executive because the parliament is sovereign and therefore, no external controls can be put on the authority of parliament and the parliament can delegate its legislative powers to any extent to which it wishes. The power to legislate includes in itself the power to delegate and when the power to legislate includes within it the power to delegate. The power to delegate or the power of delegation or the power of delegated legislation in particular becomes inherent power of parliament, inherent legislative power of parliament. When the power of delegated legislation is inherent legislative power of parliament, then the parliament could delegate its legislative powers to any extent to which it wishes. Then the question arises that if the parliament could delegate even the essential legislative powers which have been essentially assigned to it by the constitution, by the constitutional law and if we try to find out the answer to this question. I believe that the answer goes in affirmative in positive with reference to British parliament. When the parliament is sovereign and when the power to delegate is inherent power of parliament within the power of legislation, then the British parliament can delegate its legislative powers to any extent to it to which it wishes, meaning thereby that if the British parliament wishes to delegate even its essential legislative powers, no authority is there, no external limitation is there over the authority of parliament to check it, to prevent it from doing so. It means that if parliament decides to delegate even the essential legislative powers it can delegate being sovereign. That was very big question in Britain. Delegated legislation became the need of 20th century because of the transformation of the state from laissez sphere concept to the welfare concept. It could not be avoided, it could not be ignored, it became the need of the hour, it became the inevitability in this state of circumstances, it was also equally important that for the sake of parliamentary sovereignty principle, for the preservation of the parliamentary sovereign sovereignty principle, there must be some mechanism. So, that the parliament may not delegate its essential legislative powers, because if any legislature, any parliament delegates its essential legislative powers or delegate its all the powers to the executive, then certainly it would efface itself. It will abdicate from all the functions assigned to it and sovereignty of parliament resides in the legislative competence of parliament. The Sovereignty of parliament resides in the legislative authority of parliament and if all that legislative authority is delegated to any other institution, any other body, any other branch of the government, then certainly the parliamentary sovereignty principle will be diluted. And this dilution to the principle of parliamentary sovereignty 
will be hazard to the English legal system. As we know that the English legal system, whole English legal system is founded on two important constitutional principles. Number one, the rule of law and number two, the parliamentary sovereignty. So, that was the big challenge to preserve the parliamentary sovereignty along with the power to delegate the legislative powers in the situation when the authority of parliament cannot be controlled. In this background, again there is the reference of Dunungmur committee, which we have had many times in earlier discussions. This Dunungmur committee was very important committee in the history of legal and constitutional development in UK, particularly with reference to the law relating to the delegated legislation or the administrative law itself. And therefore, we have the reference of Donogmore committee many times in our discussions. This Donogmore committee or the committee on ministers powers in its recommendations suggested for parliament to have to follow to adopt the doctrine of self restraint. So, that the essential legislative powers may not be delegated and the principle of parliamentary sovereignty may be preserved. This recommendation of Donumur committee became significant for the British parliament with regard to the extent of or the permissible limits of delegated legislation in UK. Ordinary we know that the British parliament is sovereign and it can delegate its legislative powers to any extent to which it wishes. There are no limits which have been put by the constitution to the parliament that the parliament can delegate only to this extent. But for the preservation of this parliamentary sovereignty principle itself, it is important that the parliament must retain its essential legislative powers with it. And for this, the Donungmur committee recommended for the doctrine of self restraint and the parliament was suggested to adopt to follow the doctrine of self restraint for the preservation of parliamentary sovereignty principle. It was suggested by Donungmur committee that parliament should define in express terms the precise limits subject to which administrative authority is to exercise law making powers. According to the recommendation made by Donungmur committee, two fold suggestions were given or the restrictions were suggested at two stages. For the parliament itself, the doctrine of self restraint because no external limitations can be fixed by the parliament and for the delegate, it was suggested that the parliament at the time of making the delegated legislation in the parent act itself, in the enabling act itself should define the express limits subject to which the delegate is to work out the delegated legislation or the delegate is to enact or to make the delegated legislation. The express limits for delegated legislation the express limits for the delegate should be defined by the parliament itself in the parent act in the enabling act. I think you heard the term parent act first time. The parent act or the enabling act is the legislation is the enactment made by parliament through which the parliament delegates its legislative powers. It is called the parent act by which the powers are delegated to the administrative body. And in this parent act itself in the enabling it is also called as enabling act because it makes the administrative authority enabled to make the delegated legislation. So, in this parent act or in this enabling act itself the parliament should define the limits to which the delegate could 
make the delegated legislation in express terms. This recommendation of Donogmore committee seems to be of very greater significance. In the absence of any express constitutional limitations over the authority of parliament to delegate and it may serve or it may help for the preservation of the parliamentary sovereignty principle in Britain. Then we come to the status of delegated legislation in US or the permissible limits of delegated legislation in USA. Before going through the details of the permissible limits of delegated legislation in US, it is relevant for us to know the emergence or the evolution, the growth, the development of delegated legislation in US. We know that the basic or the fundamental constitutional principle in America is the doctrine of separation of powers. The whole structure of American constitution is grounded on this basic doctrine of separation of powers and the process of delegated legislation, the power of delegated legislation, the rule making power of the administration, it is certainly the negation to the doctrine of separation of powers. So, this doctrine of separation of powers has been the barrier in the path of delegated legislation in US or even to the growth and development of administrative law itself. Doctrine of separation of powers became the barrier for the growth and development of delegated legislation because under the process of delegated legislation the executive branch of the state the administration is authorized to make the legislation whereas the legislative powers have been assigned to the legislature to perform or to exercise. Because of this fact US Supreme Court the Supreme Court of America denied to recognize the delegated legislation in US. Initially the Supreme Court of US did not recognize the delegated legislation, denied to permit, denied to allow, denied to recognize the delegated legislation there in America because of two important reasons. Number one the doctrine of separation of powers and number two the doctrine of delegators non potest delegare. These two were taken as the ground to deny the process of delegated legislation to recognize the delegated legislation in America. The US Supreme Court says that because of the doctrine of separation of powers are the basic or fundamental constitutional principle, we cannot permit, we cannot allow, we cannot recognize the process of delegated legislation, we cannot recognize the rule making power of the administration, we cannot confer the rule making powers on the executive branch of the state. The second reason which was given by the Supreme Court for denying the recognition for delegated legislation was delegators non potest delegare. Delegators non potest delegare means that further delegation is not allowed. Once the delegation has been made then the delegate cannot further delegate its delegated powers to any other authority. Under the process of delegated legislation, the parliament or the congress in US, it delegates its legislative powers to the executive. American Supreme Court says that congress cannot do so. Why the congress cannot do so? Why the congress cannot delegate its legislative powers to the executive? The Supreme Court answers to this question by saying that the American Congress is itself the delegate of American people. It is the representative of American people. The American people delegated their powers to the Congress to delegate as their representative. 
so the american congress itself is the delegate of american people and it cannot further delegate its legislative powers under the principle of under the doctrine of delegators non potest delegator because of these two reasons the american supreme court denied to recognize the delegated legislation in america but it is the hard fact that the delegated legislation had become the need of the time and without delegated legislation the administration was not capable of to do its all the functions which it assumed during the very complex form of the government in the regime of welfare state and therefore it is said with reference to american legal system with reference to the recognition of the delegated legislation by the supreme court of us that pragmatic considerations prevailed over the theoretical objections there were two theoretical objections against the growth of delegated legislation against the emergence of delegated legislation against the recognition of delegated legislation against the permission to the rule making powers in the hands of administration these two theoretical objections were the doctrine of separation of powers and the delegators non potest delegator but these two theoretical objections failed to prevent the delegated legislation to emerge out to be developed because of its grave need because of its inevitability in this modern and complex form of the government and therefore prevailed the the pra practical considerations or pragmatic considerations prevailed over the theoretical objections in america and american supreme court had to recognize the process of delegated legislation the exigencies of modern government made it impossible to make complete separation in all the three organs of the state that is also the reason that american supreme court which included the doctrine of separation of powers in its first three opening provisions and gave the constitutional status to it first time all over the world the american constitution is the first constitution which gave the constitutional status to the doctrine of separation of powers despite this fact the complete separation could not be made even by the makers of american constitution because of this hard fact the exigencies of modern government and in these exigencies of the modern government it is not possible to make the complete separation and therefore the american supreme court had to recognize the delegated legislation in america it is also true that when any institution when any organization when any person do any work in compulsion or gives any permission any grant in compulsion then it also imposes some limitations over it so the american supreme court under the compulsion of the need of delegated legislation had to recognize the delegated legislation in us but at the same time it was also thought by the supreme court of us that the american congress cannot be given free hand the american congress cannot be given such unlimited power to delegate its legislative powers to the executive as it is enjoyed by the british parliament the american supreme court was of the opinion that american congress and the british parliament these are two institutions on two different footings the british parliament was the sovereign institution the sovereign authority whereas the american congress was to work under the written constitution american supreme court says that we are ruled by the written constitution therefore the american congress cannot be given unlimited authority unlimited powers 
to delegate its legislative powers. Though it has become the need, it has become the requirement for the effective governance for the effective administration in the regime of welfare state to achieve the objectives of it and therefore, the delegated legislation may be allowed, but subject to certain limitations. Unlimited powers cannot be given to the Congress. Congress can delegate, but it cannot delegate without any limits, without any restrictions uncontrolled delegation or unlimited delegation is not allowed in America. That was the opinion of the American Supreme Court and in imposing the restrictions over the authority of Congress to delegate in specifying the limits of the authority of Congress to delegate its legislative powers to the executive. The doctrine of excessive delegation was evolved by the American Supreme Court and the restriction or the limitation was put on the authority of Congress to delegate its legislative powers in the form of doctrine of excessive delegation. What does doctrine of excessive delegation means? The excessive delegation, the doctrine of excessive delegation means that the Congress could delegate, but cannot delegate without any restrictions, without any limitations. Excessive delegation is not allowed. Unlimited delegation is not allowed. When any delegation becomes unlimited delegation, when any delegation becomes excessive delegation, this is also the matter of inquiry, the matter of a relevant question that what do we mean by excessive delegation? when any delegation made by the Congress would be considered to be excessive delegation. Friends, in accordance with the opinion of the Supreme Court of US, excessive delegation means the delegation of essential legislative powers. The US Supreme Court says that if the Congress delegates its essential legislative powers, then such a delegation would amount to be excessive delegation and such excessive delegation is not allowed, such excessive delegation is unconstitutional, such excessive delegation is ultra virus. Then further a more relevant question arises to understand the doctrine of excessive delegation or to implement the doctrine of excessive delegation that what are the essential legislative powers unless we do not know the meaning of essential legislative powers we cannot enforce we cannot implement the doctrine of excessive delegation the restrictions cannot be put over the authority of legislature without knowing the meaning of essential legislative powers without knowing that what are the essential legislative powers. Only after knowing that what are the essential legislative powers, we can design any delegation as the excessive delegation if such kind of powers are delegated. So, it is very important to demarcate to identify the essential legislative powers for the proper and effective implementation of the doctrine of excessive delegation. The Supreme Court of US at the time of evolving the doctrine of excessive delegation also explained the essential legislative powers that what are the essential legislative powers. The Supreme Court of US says that essential legislative powers means laying down the policy and enacting that policy as the binding rule of conduct, providing for minimum standards, providing for the guidelines for the delegate to adopt, for the delegate to follow. This is the meaning of essential legislative powers 
in accordance with the opinion of US Supreme Court. It means that at the time of making the delegation, the American Congress was required to provide for the policy of the enactment and the delegate could be delegated the legislative powers only for carrying out that policy and therefore, the Congress was required to declare that legislative policy which was laid down by the Congress itself at the time of enacting the parent act as the binding rule of conduct for the delegate. The legislative policy to be the binding rule of conduct for the delegate means that delegate is to make the delegated legislation only for carrying out that legislative policy. It cannot make the delegated legislation for any exterior purpose, for any other purpose. It is to make the delegated legislation only and only for carrying out that basic or fundamental policy which has been laid down by the legislature itself at the time of making the delegated legislation at the time of making the delegation of legislative powers. And therefore, the enactment of the policy by the legislature in the parent act itself and declaring that enacted policy as the binding rule of conduct for the delegate is the essential legislative powers. It is also important for the legislature at the time of delegating the powers to the executive to prescribe for the minimum standards, to prescribe for the guidelines to be followed by the delegate in the process of making the delegated legislation. These have been identified as the essential legislative powers and if the Congress delegates its legislative powers without enacting the policy without providing for the minimum standards and guidelines, then certainly it would amount to be excessive delegation. Under the doctrine of excessive delegation, the executive or the administrative authority is not allowed to enact the policy of enactment. The legislative policy is not allowed to be enacted by the executive under the doctrine of separation of powers. So, what are the essential legislative functions of the legislature? The legislature is required to perform these essential legislative functions by itself only and it cannot delegate these essential legislative functions or essential legislative powers. Thus, the doctrine of separation of powers was evolved by the US Supreme Court to impose a check, a limitation, a restriction, a restraint or a control over the authority of Congress in making the delegated legislation. In such a way, a balance was created by the US Supreme Court in between the pragmatic considerations, pragmatic considerations means the need and requirement of delegated legislation and the theoretical objections, theoretical objections in the form of the doctrine of separation of powers and delegators non potest delegate. The limitations were imposed by the American Supreme Court and if we try to find out the follow up of this doctrine of excessive delegation in America or the approach of American Supreme Court with regard to the limitations of delegated legislation, we can refer to two important cases decided by the Supreme Court. The Panama Refining Company versus Rayan which was decided in 1935 and also the Yakus versus US which was decided in 1944. In Parama refining company case, the section 9 of industrial recovery act was in question. Under the uh, section 9 of industrial recovery act, the president was given the power to impose the restriction or to prohibit, to regulate and to prohibit the trade in interstate, interstate trade in the oil 
when the oil is produced in the axis of the quota fixed for a state. Meaning thereby that if any state produces the oil in the axis of the quota fixed to that state, then it is not allowed to trade this oil outside the boundaries of its own state. Interstate trade was not allowed, the president by issuing the order could regulate or could even prohibit the interstate trade in oil if the oil was produced in the axis of the quota fixed to a particular state. When this piece of delegated legislation or this delegation of power by the congress to the president under which the president could prohibit the interstate trade of oil if the oil was produced in the axis of the quota fixed for a state. It was challenged on the ground of excessive delegation. It was contended that section 9 of industrial recovery act wherein the power has been delegated to the president is hit by the doctrine of excessive delegation because it gives the bare power unlimited power uncontrolled power to the president for two reasons. Number one, the president is given the authority without any limitations, without laying down the policy. The legislature did not enact any policy for carrying out which the president could do so and number two, no conditions, no standards, no guidelines were provided by the legislature to the president to exercise this power. The American Supreme Court found the contention valid and declared this piece of delegated legislation, this piece of the parent act or this delegation as hit by doctrine of excessive delegation and on the ground of doctrine of by invoking the doctrine of excessive delegation on the ground of the doctrine of excessive delegation, this delegation by the congress to the president was declared to be unconstitutional. The second case is Yakus versus US decided 1944. By comparing these two cases, you can very well understand the invocation of the application of doctrine of excessive delegation in America and the different approach of the US Supreme Court in different scenarios or in different circumstances. In Yakus versus US, when the office of price administrator was set up during the second world war, then one policy was enacted under the act wherein the office of price administrator was enacted. It was mentioned in the enactment itself that prices fixed ought to be effectuate policy of the act to stabilize commodity prices with a view to prevent wartime inflation. This was the policy of the enactment to stabilize the commodity prices with a view to prevent wartime inflation. So, there were two objectives of this policy. Number one, to stabilize the commodity prices and these commodity prices were to be stabilized for the another purpose, another objective to stabilize the commodity prices during that period. It was also provided in the enactment that the prices fixed should be fair and equitable. The price administrator was subject to this condition that the prices to be fixed by the price administrator had to be fair and equitable. One more guideline, one more standard was prescribed in the enactment that the prices fixed had to give, had to be given due consideration, meaning thereby the price administrator had to give due consideration to the prices prevailing with in a designated base period. This was also the restriction over the price administrator, limitation over the price administrator that the price administrator had to 
give due consideration to the prices prevailing in a basic designated base period. So, these two important restrictions were imposed over the authority of price administrator in prescribing the prices in fixing the prices of commodities. When this delegation was challenged on the ground of doctrine of excessive delegation, the Supreme Court rejected the contention and Supreme Court says that the sufficient policy has been laid down by the Congress and minimum standards and guidelines have also been specified and therefore, it does not amount to be excessive delegation. This is the status of constitutionality of delegated legislation in America. The constitutionality of delegated legislation in India can be understood in three phases in three parts. Number one, during the regime of Privy Council as the highest court of appeal. During the regime of Privy Council as the highest court of appeal, there was a case naming Queen versus Bura decided in 1879 by the Privy Council. In this case, the Indian legislature passed an act to remove the Garo Hills area from the civil and criminal jurisdiction of Bengal and entrusted such power in the officer to be appointed by Lieutenant Governor of Bengal. Section 9 of this enactment authorized the Lieutenant Governor to extend any provision of the act to Kashi and Jansia Hills. Accordingly, Lieutenant Governor extended the application of the enactment to Khasi and Jaintia Hills and invested the civil and criminal jurisdiction of the area of Khasi and Jaintia Hills in the commissioner to that area. The commissioner of that area tried Mr. Vura for a murder case and he awarded the death punishment. This decision of commissioner was challenged before the high court and high court declared section 9 as invalid by saying that that Indian legislature is the delegate of British parliament and therefore, it could not further delegate its legislative powers to any other authority. So, this delegation to the governor was declared to be invalid unconstitutional. When this matter reached to the privy council, privy council reverted the disapproved the decision of Calcutta high court by saying that. Indian Congress is not delegate of British Parliament. The Privy Council upheld the validity of section 9 by saying that section 9 is valid being conditional legislation. The decision of the Privy Council can be interpreted in two ways. Number one that the, the Indian legislature was not the delegate of British Parliament and number two that the delegation of legislative powers could be made. This is the one aspect. Another aspect is as the Privy Council says that section 9 was valid being the conditional legislation, it means that the delegation was allowed in India only to the extent of conditional legislation. We have discussed the conditional legislation in our earlier lecture. In conditional legislation, there is no delegation of any legislative powers, only the discretion to enforce the law on the emergence of some conditions, on the satisfaction of some conditions, this discretion is delegated to the executive. The complete law is made by the legislature, only the enforcement discretion for the enforcement in certain conditions, it, this power is delegated to the administration. So, being the conditional legislation, it was delegated, it means that the delegation of legislative powers in India was allowed only to the extent of conditional legislation. The position was not clear. Then Emperor versus Benwari Lal, again the doctrine of excessive, against the doctrine of conditional legislation was invoked by the Privy Council. Then the second phase with regard to the constitutionality of delegated legislation in India is Jatin Nath versus is the regime of federal court, when the federal court was established. During the regime of federal court in India or the superior most appellate court, the federal court was in place of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of India after the commencement of Indian constitution, the Supreme Court of India replaced the federal court. 
Jatin Nath versus province of Bihar decided 1949 by the federal court and in, th in this case Jatin Nath versus province of Bihar, the Bihar maintenance of public order act 1948 was in question. This Bihar maintenance of public order act the section 3 delegated the power to provincial government to extend the life of the enactment for further one year with such modification as it may deem fit. The delegation of power of the extension along with the power of modification was made. The federal court held this delegation of power of extension along with the power of modification as unconstitutional being essential legislative power and the federal court says that essential legislative power cannot be delegated and therefore, the power of extension along with the power of modification was unconstitutional to be delegated. It may mean that if only the power of extension would have been delegated in section 3 of Bihar Maintenance of Public Order Act, it would have declared to be constitutional by the federal court. But when the power, power of extension associated with the power of modification was delegated, it became unconstitutional. Then the post constitutional regime that is the phase after the commencement of Indian constitution. At the time of commencement of Indian constitution, or after the commencement of Indian constitution, after the establishment of the Supreme Court of India, the precedent was the Jatin Nath versus state of Bihar, Jatin Nath versus province of Bihar. And in accordance with that precedence, the Indian legislature was not allowed to delegate any legislative powers. The verdict of federal court in Jatin Nath case means that the power could be delegated only to the extent of conditional legislation not beyond that. When the power of extension associated with the power of modification, then it becomes unconstitutional means that the legislative power cannot be delegated, meaning thereby that delegated legislation was not allowed. But we know and we have discussed that after the commencement of Indian constitution, the Indian state was established as the welfare state and there was the need of delegated legislation as we know. Then the president of India referred the matter for the opinion of the Supreme Court under article 143 of Indian constitution to know the constitutionality of delegated legislation in India under the case of Delhi Lodge Act and the constitutionality of delegated legislation was upheld by the Supreme Court of India in Delhi Lodge Act case by observing that the delegated legislation has become the inevitability, the need of the hour and therefore, the delegated legislation is allowed. But to what limitations the delegated legislation was allowed in India? The Supreme Court imposes some restrictions over the authority of Indian parliament to delegate its legislative powers to the executive. There were two models before the Supreme Court of India to adopt the American model and the British model, but we have the similarities and dissimilarities with both the legal systems. Like British legal system, we have the parliamentary form of the government, but unlike the British legal system, we have the supremacy of the constitution not the sovereignty or supremacy of parliament. Like American constitution, we have the written constitution, we are ruled by the written constitution, but unlike the American legal system, we do not have the separation of powers or the basic or fundamental constitutional principle. And therefore, the Supreme Court decided in Delhi Lodge Act case that the delegated legislation is allowed. But as we are ruled by the written constitution, we cannot allow the Indian legislature to enjoy the power of delegated legislation to that extent to which the British parliament enjoys. And therefore, there must be some restrictions, some limitations 
over the authority of parliament in making the delegation. What limitation should be there? The judges of the Supreme Court were divided on this matter and they expressed the different opinions, but ultimately the majority held that that there must be the limitations over the authority of parliament and that limitation should be in the form of such principle or such restriction that the parliament may not delegate its essential legislative powers. It was decided by the Supreme Court in Delhi Law Act case that Indian parliament is allowed to delegate, but it cannot delegate its essential legislative powers. What are the essential legislative powers? The Indian Supreme Court also explains the essential legislative powers in the same manner, in the same way as these are defined or explained by the US Supreme Court. So, though not directly, but indirectly the Indian Supreme Court in Delhi Law Act case adopted the doctrine of excessive delegation and this doctrine of excessive delegation was further followed by the Supreme Court of India in many cases. If you go through the cases decided by the Supreme Court, particularly Gwalior Rayan versus Union of India, the doctrine of excessive delegation was continuously, it is continuously being followed in India and Indian legislature is allowed to delegate its legislative powers to the executive, but not unlimitedly, but subject to some limitations, subject to some restraints, subject to some restrictions and these restrictions or limitations are imposed over the authority of parliament to delegate its legislative powers in the form of excessive delegation that the parliament cannot delegate its essential legislative powers. It means that at the time of making the delegated legislation, the Indian parliament is to lay down the underlying policy of the enactment and to declare this underlying policy of the enactment as the binding rule of conduct. And the delegate is allowed only to carry out this policy to make the delegated legislation for carrying out that policy which has been laid down by the parliament during making the delegation under the parent act. So, this is the status of delegated legislation or these are the permissible limits of delegated legislation in India. We also know the fact that at some times the Supreme Court allows even the broad delegations because of the need, because of the special circumstances of individual cases, but doctrine of excessive delegation is continuously being followed by the courts in India in examining the constitutionality of delegated legislation or permissible limits of delegated legislation. Thank you very much.